you'll turn now to the fifth chapter of Romans, as we look together this morning at the nature of God's love. And this passage in Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. The very famous Swiss theologian Karl Barth, toward the end of his life, came over to this country for a series of lectures. We may not agree with everything and do not agree with everything that Karl Barth taught. He taught a lot of things right and some things wrong, but still recognized as a very great theologian. And giving this series of lectures after one particularly impressive lecture that he gave in typical American style. One of the students came up afterwards and said, Dr. Bart, what is the greatest thought that has ever passed through your mind? And this aging professor paused for a long time as he gave real thought to that question. What is the greatest thought that has ever passed through my mind? And this very brilliant, this very intellectual, this very distinguished man said very simply, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And we could not agree more heartily with Karl Barth in that statement. Now we are coming into this section here on God's love. We've looked at the results, the riches of justification in verses 1 and 2. We have peace with God. We have access to God in the throne of grace. We have a hope. We rejoice or exult in, as we see at the end of verse 2, in the hope of the glory of God. Then last week we looked at verses 3 through 5 about exulting in tribulation. And we have had explained to us there how to exult in tribulation. And yet not all believers are exulting in tribulation. Most believers, many believers at least, as they go through tribulation, do about everything else but exult in it. And many are made bitter, resentful, and even angry and or discouraged, depressed. We ask ourselves, what's wrong? What's, what's the missing thing here? We have seen from verse 3, we also exult in our tribulations, and various reasons are given there. And exulting in tribulation does not come about automatically. And we say, what makes the difference? And the difference is knowing and responding to the love of God in the midst of that tribulation, of being able to relate to a God who loves us infinitely, God himself being infinite, and because he himself is infinite and love is not just some thing, but is an expression of himself, that love is infinite. And of course at the moment of pain and hurt it's very easy for us to feel that God does not love us. It's easy to feel neglected, unloved, and that's why we need to understand the argument of verses 6 through 11. As we begin to experience and respond to God's love, then we, that's the, the basic link, that's the basic building block, is to be, we, then we can exult in tribulation as we know and respond to his love. So first of all this morning, I want us to look at the fact that God's love is causeless. And we see this basically in verses 6 through 8 of our passage. And we ask ourselves now, why did God send his son to die for us? And the ob obvious answer comes back, because of his love for us. And then the next question is, why does he love us? 
Why did he love us in that kind of a way, that supreme way? Why does he love us? And we cannot give a full answer to that question. We can only give relative, comparative type answers. To understand the love of God is something that is totally incomprehensible. He himself is incomprehensible and his love is incomprehensible. But we can see, of course, God's nature is love. God is love. And we can see how his love is revealed. And we can, say, we can see to whom it was revealed and get some kind of, a, of an inkling, some kind of a grasp of his love. Now, you remember Romans, as we are here in the fifth chapter, is painted in the background of the first four chapters, which shows man lost, man separated from God, man in rebellion against God by nature, and man under the wrath of God because of his sin and his rebellion. And now we see from that background, that coming out in bold relief from the black background of our sinfulness, and God's wrath, we see God's love being portrayed. So first of all, God's love is causeless. And we see it as it's revealed, and particularly to whom it is revealed. And we see it in verse 5, or rather in verse 6. For while we were still helpless, we see it is to the helpless that this love is revealed. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And we see, first of all, that by nature we are helpless. Thayer and his lexicon said that we, this word denotes that we are weak, infirm, feeble, unable to achieve anything great, destitute of power among men, sluggish in doing right. And it is really basically impossible for man to do anything for himself. That is, that will please God. A man can do all kinds of things, but as far as satisfying God is concerned, man cannot do anything to really satisfy God in his own power, his own strength. And we saw, if you'll turn back very quickly to chapter 3, verses uh, 10 through 12, this statement, this all-encompassing statement about man's helplessness, Romans 3, verses 10 through 12. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. That is, in his own natural desires, his own natural ability. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Then we see that man also is ungodly. We are without reverence for God as we are by nature. Not merely irreligious, but acting in contravention to God's demands. Ungodly. And so it's not just a helplessness that is well intentioned, but we see also from verse 6 that it is the helplessness that is characterized also by ungodliness. And we, I believe, early and easily learn that we are not godly. We are not godlike. But the hardest lesson that we learn, if indeed we do learn it, is to see the fact that we are helpless. We are incurably addicted to this self-help method in every direction and certainly in our relationship with God. Somehow we have ingrained within us by nature that we can merit the favor, the acceptance of God. And we find this a very, very hard lesson to learn that we are helpless. And so we see, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And, of course, we see the cross, God extending himself through the person of his son at the cross in view of us, in, in the background of us that's helpless and ungodly. 
And then we see verses 7 and 8. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And let's consider this argument here as, as we try to get the picture of what the apostle under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is trying to convey in verses 7 and 8. And this is talking about human love. It's talking about how in human love others we ourselves possibly considering could consider at some time laying down our life for someone else. Jesus said in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, than that a man lay down his life for his friends. Now the highest example of human love is that we would lay down our lives for our friends. That's the highest example. It's the highest thing we could possibly think of. And when we read about things in the newspapers or we hear about some act of heroism, some act, at least ostensibly, of some self-sacrificing love and actually laying, someone laying down his life for someone else, we need to analyze what's behind that. I think immediately we can eliminate all Christians who, under the direction and the love of God, have laid down their lives. This, this takes us out of the area of human love. This is supernatural love. This is the love of God as we see in verse 5 that is shed abroad or poured forth within our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. And there are many who belong, belong to Jesus Christ and under his control have placed themselves into that area of peril or infection and have consciously, voluntarily, deliberately laid down their lives for another person. And they were motivated not by human love, basically, but by divine love. And we can eliminate that as far as considering human love, and that's the argument here, is considering what human love might do. But there are other examples, a soldier who dies in battle for his country, or a mother or father who rushes into a burning building or jumps into freezing running waters and is drowned as they, as they give their lives for something else or even their own children. Or we think of the policeman or the fireman or the casual passerby who, who rushes into a place of danger and peril and gives their life for someone else. And yet, in many of these cases, in fact, probably most of these cases, they did this as a calculated risk. They somehow thought that they would come out of this situation successfully. They took the chance and believed that they would come out safely and successfully them themselves as well as the person they were trying to rescue. It was a calculated risk. They did not give their lives voluntarily, deliberately, specifically in the place of another person. That's what happens so many times. And then, of course, other times, there is, the, there is no time to decide. There is this impulse of the person giving their life, and they have no time at all to think. Here's the mother who sees their child fall into the water, and the mother maybe not knowing how to swim, and she jumps in impulsively without even thinking, and she herself drowns. Now, I don't mean to minimize these acts at all. They are real acts of bravery and courage. And yet it was not a deliberate, voluntary, specific laying down one's life for the other. It was a calculated risk. But at times, again, we're looking simply at human love. There are times when some will, will do this. A pilot, an, a, a soldier, whoever he may be, may go deliberately on a suicide mission. He knows that there's no chance whatsoever of his coming back safely, alive. And he deliberately lays down his life for his friends, his family, for the cause of freedom, and so on. Or 
As I was reading recently, there was this accident in a mine, a uh, coal mine. There was this gaping gas. And uh, there was this young man whose gas mask was perfectly all right. And here was this other man who had, was married and had three children, an older man. And uh, his gas mask was damaged, was torn because of the falling debris. And the younger man, his friend, said, you have Mary and the children, and they need you. I'm alone, I'm single, and I can go. And he deliberately laid down his life in order that that other man may live. And we stand on holy ground when we consider that kind of a sacrifice, that kind of human love that would, would do that, take, it, take another person's place and sacrifice his life for someone else. I was reading in Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse's expositions on Romans this last week, and he gave an example also of a crippled girl who lived in the slums, and she underwent a surgery which was calculated to enable her to walk. And at the end of the surgery, she needed a transfusion. She had a 14-year-old brother, a tough boy of the streets, and he volunteered to, to give her a transfusion. And as he underwent this, he saw the blood being drained from out of his own veins. He sat there very tight-lipped, grim, and silent through the whole transfusion process. The doctor came along at the end and put his hand on his shoulder and said, well, you're very brave. You've taken this very well and commended that boy. And the boy, not understanding the nature of a blood transfusion, looked up to him and said, Doc, how long before I croak? <laughs> and as far as he knew, he was giving his life for his, his sister. As far as he knew, he was deliberately substituting himself there and, and voluntarily, deliberately laying down his life. And there are some of these examples very few and far between, but there are some that we can look at. And that's what Paul is talking about here in verses 7 and 8. And of course, when it talks about a righteous man and a good man, it's talking in an accommodated sense. We looked at Romans 3, verses 10 through 12, and we saw that they're in an absolute sense. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none good, not even one, as far as how we stack up, how we are in the sight of God. But here it's being used in a comparative sense, in a relative sense, as we compare ourselves with one another. And it says, for even, for one will hardly die for a righteous man. Here's a man who is righteous. Uh, I think the implication here is that he is rigidly righteous. There's an austerity there. There's something admirable, there's something honorable, but something hard. And not too many people are inspired to die for a righteous man. Then it goes on and talks about the good man. This is a man who is righteous, but his righteousness has been softened and has been uh, enhanced and made attractive. There's a graciousness, there's a beneficence that, there about this man's life. And he will inspire more, but only a few even would die even for a good man as we see this in verse 7, for one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man some would, even, some would even dare to die. But, now the contrast here of God's love, but God demonstrates, and that's in the present tense even, it's still being demonstrated as we look back historically at what he did at the cross. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still in rebellion against God, he sent his son and Christ died for us. And so here's the great contrast as we get an implication, as we try to understand the kind of love that God has for us. Again, impossible to understand it in its fullness and yet to get a glimpse, at least to see 
to whom this love was extended. Now, God's love does not need a motive outside of itself. He loves because he is love. That's his nature. But humanly, we in human love must have a motive outside of ourselves if we're loving simply with human love. We, we will love if the object of our love is worthy, if it's admirable, if it's honorable, if it's lovely, if it's lovable. But God's love is extended to the helpless, to the ungodly, to the sinner, and even as the passage progresses to the enemy. God loves us in spite of ourselves. There is nothing within us that draws out his love toward us, so that everything repels that holy love. He loves us in spite of ourselves. And so we see the contrast here. We in human love possibly might see some instances where a righteous man is died for, or a good man. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Ephesians, the third chapter, as I simply read this to you, Paul has prayed a prayer for the Ephesian believers, a prayer that God in his grace works out in our lives more and more as we walk with him. But in this prayer, not only did he pray that Christ may dwell, come down and step down and make his home in our hearts through faith, and that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may, may be able to comprehend with all the things what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that we may be filled up to all the fullness of God. This is the prayer that he prayed for these Ephesian believers in which is a prayer for us as well. That we might know the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth of this love. Instead of Nansen, the famous explorer, when he was up in the, the northern ocean, trying to measure the, the depth of the ocean at that time, at that, that particular place in the far north. On the first day, he put out his measuring rod and dropped it down, a measuring line. And uh, it went down so many feet, and he recorded that but uh, it did not reach the bottom of the ocean, and so he wrote in his record, deeper than that. The next day he dropped a longer line, and it went down so many hundreds of feet, and so on, thousands of feet, and it still did not touch, touch the bottom. And so he recorded the number of feet, and then he wrote in his record, deeper than that. He did this for several days, dropping longer and longer measuring lines and still did not touch the bottom of the ocean. And so finally he tied them all together and dropped the line over the side of the ship. And that, of course, was measured but did not touch the bottom of the ocean. And he wrote in his record again, deeper than that. He knew how deep it, it was, at least to a certain point, but not to the, do the bottom of the ocean. He had to leave, not knowing the depth of that ocean. And we ourselves, as we try to fathom God's love, as we try to, to understand its depth, can only understand it in a relative way. We can think of the love, the, the parent for the child, or the husband for the wife, or the wife for the husband. Or we can think of love that is extended to those in the body. What a beautiful thing it was to see in the death of uh, Catherine Curley this last week and to see how believers in this church and her church, other church here in town, uh, how believers just pitched in and just took care of that woman in such a beautiful way and her daughter, Kathy. And the love that was extended there, the tremendous love that just impressed outsiders and everybody can concern. And we can look at that love and we can, we can get comparisons and we can combine all these 
examples that we're thinking of, and it still would not begin to, to measure the depth of the love of God. It's deeper still, and deeper still. It's infinite. And God somehow gets across to us a little bit of that love as we see human love and God's divine love dying for us while we were helpless, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners. That immense, infinite love demonstrated at the cross of Jesus Christ. Now we see not only that the love of God was causeless and really along with that measureless and still is, but the love of God is ceaseless as we see here in verses 9 through 11. So we pick up this argument further as Paul now continues to elaborate on the love of God, which is, again, that basic element that enables us to exult in tribulation. As we understand and as we respond to and as we experience the love of God, this is the element that enables us to exult in tribulation. So now we see in verses 9 through 11 that God's love is ceaseless. We see, first of all, in verse 9, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. Now this is the, one of the four much mores in Romans 5. This is the first one we're running across here. And Paul is arguing from the greater to the lesser. The argument here is that God has already done that supreme act of love. God has already accomplished this, this supreme act of self-sacrificing love has already been done by God. And as we begin to try to get the implications of this, that God, the infinitely holy and righteous, eternal, omnipotent God, would come and take upon himself human flesh and then go to a cross on the cross be substituted in your place and mine and bear his wrath against him. That God would do this, and he has done this, and he could not have done anything more. This is the, the, the absolute limit that the infinite God could possibly go to, and he did do it. That he himself and the person of Jesus Christ died in our place. And if he's done that for us while we were sinners, if he's done that for us while we were helpless, while we were ungodly, now the argument goes from the greater to the lesser. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. If he did the greater for us, we were rebelling against him, totally unworthy, totally unlovely, totally unlovable. If he did that, the supreme act, and went to that absolute limit while we were in that condition, now that we are right with him, now that we have been justified, now that we belong to him, won't he do the lesser? And that is deliver us from that ultimate day of wrath. And that's what is being referred to here, the wrath of God, the day of wrath and the judgment of God. And so we see the security of the believer being conveyed here. This love is ceaseless. And then he continues the argument in verse 10. For it is while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. If while we were enemies, and this word enemy being used here, this word expresses the conscious hostility of one who hates or opposes another. You notice it gets worse as we go along here. First of all, helpless. That doesn't sound so bad. And then ungodly, and just plain old sinners, and now enemies. It's showing what we are by nature. And again, we, we have trouble with this. We can maybe admit some of these others, but to, to think that by nature, and by attitude and action, there was a hostility in our lives to God before conversion to Christ, 
this is the attitude basically of every person outside of the saving grace of God. And yet we see that this is obviously so. Many other scriptures that would support that. And we find that this enmity may be very subtle, it may be very refined, but it is basically an enmity, a hostility to God himself. In Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 7 and 8, we see it put very clearly. Because the mind set on the flesh, that's the natural man's mind, the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. I cannot help, as I read this passage and preaching on it, think back of a time a number of years ago when I heard S. Lewis Johnson preach on this passage. He's a professor at Dallas Seminary, has been. He's the main preacher at Believer's Chapel in Dallas for most of these years. And he relates a time back in his, when he first went to theological seminary, when he first went to Dallas Seminary. And uh, he had been in business with his father. He went a little older than the average person did when they went to seminary. And uh, been in business and felt the call of God to prepare uh, himself for the formal ministry. And as he was there, he got a phone call one night from a man who was working in his father's company, in his father's business, insurance business, was, who was in Dallas. And he called him up and said, well, Lewis, I'd like to have you come down and, and uh, take you to dinner tonight. So he went down to town. Uh, to some place in Dallas and had dinner with this man and they were talking and so on and this man finally said well Lewis you you left a very lucrative business a very nice situation there with your father uh, even as it was then and the whole future of it why in the world did you do that to come here and obviously he it was a uh, real limitation on him materially as well why did you do that? And Lewis Johnson began to explain, well, because of the love of Christ, that he, if he has done that for him, to die for him, then as he was laying himself open to the specific will of God in his life, this was nothing too small. And this was during the Second World War. And this man had a son over in Libya fighting the Germans. And he said, well, I... I don't mean to offend you or anything like that, but, you know, I have a son over in Libya, and I would be willing to lay down my life, to give my life up, if I could be assured that my son would come back safely. Lewis Johnson didn't know what to say to that. He kind of hummed and hawed and so on. Went back to his dormitory room that, later that night and was thinking, and it, as it usually happens, when we talk to somebody, we we think of the good answer after it's too late, sort of. But he thought of the answer, what he should have given to that man. And I wonder what you're thinking in your own mind right now as far as what he should have told that man. And the obvious answer there, as he finally thought of it, was, would you be willing to lay down your life in order that one of the, those Germans go back home safely? And obviously the answer would have been absolutely not. But that's, that's the thrust of this. That God, in the person of Jesus Christ, laid down his life for those who were at enmity with him, that were hostile, that were his enemies. And that's you and me by nature. We see this word reconciliation here, a beautiful word. This is a cessation of enmity and estrangement between men and God. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And we might illustrate it this way. If you can somehow picture in your mind as I'm going to 
kind of give a little bit of a dramatization of this. But originally, as God created man, here was God with his arms extended, his hands extended on one side, and here's man on the other side with his arms extended and his hands extended, and they're joining hands, hand in hand. That was the condition that God created man in. There was no estrangement, there was no enmity, but there they were face to face, hand in hand. But man, given a free will, exercised that will in disobedience to God and turned his back on God. Now God, through the cross between man and himself, Reconciliation was effected as God placed the cross between man and himself, potentially and then actually in the coming of Jesus Christ. And only as man turns and receives this reconciliation is this face-to-face, -face, hand hand-to-hand relationship restored. And so we see that this is what has happened through the cross of Jesus Christ. Reconciliation was effected, and reconciliation as it is accepted restores that relationship. The estrangement, the enmity, is, is brought to an end. And again, the argument here is from the greater to the lesser, as we see it. Much more again. Here's the greater, the supreme act. The once and for all sacrifice of love at the cross of Jesus Christ. He's done that for us while we were helpless, while we were ungodly, while we were sinners, while we were enemies. He did that, the supreme act that could, nothing more could be done while we were in that condition. Now the lesser, now that we are his friends, now that we love him, now that we desire to do his will above everything else in life, as he has given us a renewed will in Jesus Christ, now, won't he do the lesser? Won't he save us? Won't he preserve us? Won't he keep us secure through his life? That's referring to the resurrection life of Christ, which we're going to dwell on very heavily in the sixth and following chapters in Romans. So his death reconciles us, but his life preserves us. And if he's already gone to that extent, while we were enemies, won't he do the lesser now that we're his friends? And so we see the final statement here in verse 11. And not only this, we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. We talked about exulting in God in verse 2, exulting in hope. Exulting in tribulation in verse 3, but now we see it's exulting in God. That's where our real exulting focus is on. That's the highest form of exulting. This is what is the, the background and the, the framework of all exulting, is exulting in God himself through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. His love is causeless, along with that measureless, and his love is also ceaseless. And as we begin to get the implications of how he has extended, how he has revealed this love, and to whom he has revealed it, and as we focus upon this fact, whether we feel it or not, experience it or not, whether we believe it or not, it's true. God's love is there, constant. It's an infant. It's an uncaused love. It's a senseless love. It's the measureless love. And we are enabled, therefore, to exult in tribulation. In the hymn, The Love of God, the last stanza was added after this hymn was originally written. And the final stanza is perhaps the best one of all and was found written on a wall in a room in a mental institution. And the man who wrote it obviously was counted by society as mentally insane or mentally disturbed. 
but he had obviously come to know the God of love. In this last stanza he wrote, Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, though stretched from sky to sky. O oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forever more endure the saints and angels' song. And this is the song of every one of us who through Jesus Christ have come to know the infinite love of God.